My M1 MacBook Air is going in for a little trade-in ski, and my aging Omen box will likely be sold to friends or fam at bargain basement pricing as it turns five years old later in the year. So what am I replacing this with? This one right here. Well, I'm finally going to do my heavy photo editing and video editing on the same portable machine. And it's going to be the 16 inch MacBook Pro with an M2 Max chip, ideally for the next three to five years. Future Dan here, these naming conventions suck. The December 2020 base model MacBook Air I refer to throughout as the Air and my new MacBook Pro I refer to as the Max or just the M2. Let's jump right into the Adobe app performance because that's why you clicked and that's why I'm into this computer for myself. But stick around for the back half of the video if you want to understand why I chose my size and my spec and why I went with the M2, this new just released generation over the previous M1 generation. It seems like there might be two schools of thought emerging around the M2 versus M1 decision around the time of release and I might hold the more unpopular opinion. Apple is saying that in this machine, you get about a 20% bump over the previous generation. There are others that are already geek benching, and this seems plausible. In practice, I don't think many people are going to update from the previous generation to this one, and I'm more of a real world tester. Let's run through some of the ordinary tasks that I might do on a daily, weekly, monthly basis, and see if there's any lag compared to the M1 Air because I know for sure there is starting to be in Lightroom. And I've never really even attempted to use this machine for multi-track 4K video editing, you know, beyond the occasional short that's less than 30 seconds. To be fair to the Air, I still did all of my Lightroom and Photoshop work on it until just a few days ago when I got the M2. Recently, Adobe has brought some powerful masking updates to Lightroom, and I typically use several of them on most photos. And bigger catalogs have always been slow on the Air. I just imported and generated previews for a full copy of my Ireland folder onto each machine into fresh projects, both using the same fast SanDisk drives, obviously with OBS running. I'll get to my spec later, but in practice, I'll still be doing most of my work directly off these SanDisk drives for the life of this machine. The M2 loaded photos into that fresh catalog more than two times as fast. Exporting the first 250 RAWs unedited as PNGs at full res took 29 minutes and 52 seconds on the air compared to a zippy 8 minutes and 45 seconds on the max. This is one of the things that bugs me most about the air. I live with it for personal projects, but when I'm editing a paid project on this machine, and I already have my edited selects, all I wanna do at the end is get those files prepped for delivery as quickly as possible. And I don't wanna to have to close other apps to speed up that export. Next, I just wanna get you a feel of swiping through, masking, and responsiveness. Another thing that bugs me about the Air now is the lag in culling. That can really be annoying for large catalogs, definitely when you're overshooting, or if you're trying to quickly compare several different edits of the same photo and you're keying back and forth. The M2 is a massive upgrade for me and is buttery smooth, instant loads of these photos as I'm keying through. The Canon R6 is a lower megapixel body and I got this camera in 2021 in part because the smaller files would allow me to utilize the computing power that I could afford better. The early M1 stuff was certainly impressive with what it could do at the price point, and certainly at this ultra portable form factor. It's a big reason I got this for freelancing because I knew I was going to take my road trip, but the M2 Max is something else. Jumping into Premiere now, I'm exporting my most recent two minute video on the Air and the Max. Again, this isn't a task that I normally ever even complete on the Air. I use my Omen for that kind of thing. And that's about all I use the Omen for these days, is editing these YouTube videos. Playback is rough after a while, and I would need to proxy if I wanted to live like that. The Air does export this timeline, but it takes over three times longer than the timeline itself. The Max does it in half the time. This is a pretty simple edit and timeline. I'll display how long it took to export this particular video here once I'm finished. And me again, one more time. I know export times aren't everything, especially for YouTube. It's not like I'm taking this file and running to deliver that to somebody else. Looking at the change in export times though is one of the easier ways to relate performance across any two machines. It's one nice metric that most creatives will understand. JCH Pro wondered on the community tab how this might change my workflow to do more in a month. One of my hopes is to make more short form content with this machine. When I go on a trip, there's inevitably some downtime I almost always start a Lightroom catalog, 
if nothing else to back up and then import my photos while still on the trip. I rarely ever do that with a timeline. I just never start them while on the trip, but it's something that I'm really looking forward to. In other ways, this machine might not change too, too much in terms of my actual output. I'm still working on creative projects like photography and this YouTube channel on nights and weekends. And so there's only so much time, no matter what machine I do have. What I think this does is make the work that I'm doing on nights and weekends a lot easier and more enjoyable. And I think to be able to do that is very important so that the things that you're working on nights and weekends don't become a chore and you can still stay pretty passionate about them. I think particularly if you're monetizing your creativity, even part-time, whether that's photo shoots, video shoots, creating content, it's pretty standard to swap out and get a fast capable machine every three to five years, I'd say. I'm due and I'm just super excited that this type of power is available in a laptop form factor these days. Now that's all I have for real world performance after owning the machine for a few days. If you wanna get into the nerdier type of breakdown, I like following Tyler Stallman for that type of video. I'll link one of his below. All right, so now size and spec. And I think that's one of the toughest choices you're going to make if you want one of these machines. Here's my thought process. First of all, if you don't need a laptop, definitely consider the Mac mini to get great performance for much cheaper. I went with the 16 inch form factor. If I'm going to use this as my main machine, the whole point of going with the MacBook is to get that gorgeous large screen real estate. Otherwise, I can get this performance in a Mac mini or Mac studio. I also wanted the slightly bigger battery that comes with the 16 inch. That said, I was pretty nervous to commit to it because compared to the Air, this machine was going to be massive. I've only used a 16 inch laptop once before I had the Intel i9 MacBook Pro for work in 2020. It was about the same footprint, but it was much thinner, somewhere between what this uh, MacBook Pro is and what the MacBook Air was. I've also used the M1 13 inch MacBook Pro with a touch bar for work um, as recently as this year, and that's still extremely portable. This is considerably bigger. I'm very happy with the choice so far, but I also haven't traveled with it yet. The bezels are nice and thin. The speakers are excellent. The 1610 aspect is something that I've loved. I don't like the fact that the notch exists without housing a face ID. I wanted that fixed for this generation. You don't really notice it, so there is that. This isn't gonna be great if you like working on planes. Like if you're that person that sees a five hour flight and wants to get stuff done, this is gonna be pretty cumbersome when in the seat. If you're always plugged into a monitor at home, and if you're traveling a lot, I think the 14 inch is probably the play for you. This 16 inch, I think is a pound heavier than the 14 inch. So there are certainly going to be times over the life of the machine that I regret carrying around that extra pound, but so far so good. That's the type of thing that I'll have to follow up on later in the year after I've had a chance to travel with this more extensively. I mentioned recently that my smaller photo bag, the F-Stop Ajna, doesn't have a great built in place for larger laptops. I will be protecting this in that bag by using their case. But if you already have a bag that you love, make sure you know what your options are for carrying whatever size machine you go with. All of the M2 chips have a 12 core CPU, and I chose the middle of the road 30 core GPU over the 19 or the 38. This was a $200 bump, and I went with 32 gigs of RAM. You can choose between 32 or 64 with the 30 core GPU selected. I'm a little bit nervous about this choice long-term, I think 32 should be plenty for now and the foreseeable future. And the $400 bump from 32 to 64 gigs was just out of the budget for me for this machine. Finally, I kept it to one terabyte of storage as I really don't like paying Apple or their internal storage. On my Air, I went with the base 256 gig model and I knew that was going to be tight. But so far I've kept this machine basically to just the apps and I still have 75 gigs free. One terabyte's gonna be enough for all my apps, obviously. And then I'll probably have a miscellaneous Lightroom catalog that I can keep internally stored here. And perhaps the latest video that I'm working on, I could work off of this machine internally for that as well. And just transfer that folder once I'm done editing and exporting. Otherwise, my workflow is a fast one terabyte SanDisk for photo, a four terabyte for video that I also use to transfer full drives back and forth occasionally, and longer term backups for everything else are on slower, cheaper, five terabyte spinning drives. It's not the best workflow, but if I stay on top of backups, it works pretty well for me. I feel like this spec is probably overkill in the moment, 
gives me plenty of headroom for the next couple of years and it's gonna be snappy for the long run. I think if you're not doing any video editing, the more affordable way to go is probably the 14 inch Pro with 32 gigs of RAM, one terabyte of storage for $28.99 and it's going to be a beast. If you plan to keep it a long time, I get wary of sticking with the 16 gigs of RAM but even if you have to make that compromise, it'll still be really fast today. If I didn't have the trade-in, if I didn't have the Omen to sell, I probably wouldn't have bumped up to the 30 core GPU myself. I would have saved that $200 and I might've considered stepping back to the Pro chip as well. And finally, back to the M1 versus M2 debate. This generation, all things considered, is fairly incremental and it sets you up to pay a bit of a premium for the M2 machines given how capable the M1 generation still is today. Right now at launch, in January 2023, it's a great time to snag one of the M1 Pro or Max chips from a third-party retailer or the Apple refurbished store. I did consider that, and I think it's especially worth a look if you want one of the higher internal storage specs. This might be in the unpopular camp, but personally, for camera gear and tech, I like to try to buy the highest end the newest that I can comfortably afford at the time, and then I try to take as good care of it as I possibly can. That way, if I need to sell it later, it's gonna have a higher resale value than if I were to say, buy the M1 generation today and sell it at the same point that I might end up selling this machine for whenever I swap out next. I was pleasantly surprised on the trade-in value for this M1 Air, so I'll definitely be keeping this in tip-top shape in case I need to swap it for any reason, or in case it still retains its value as well as this did a few years down the road. And then regardless of resale value, that obviously allows me the opportunity to use the greatest tech that I can afford for the time that I keep it. So that's the strategy that works pretty well for me, but I will say it's a little bit easier to adhere to that if you have a full-time job supporting yourself and you're making some side income from photography or your creative endeavors. No matter what the spec, anything with an M chip is an incredible tool and I personally have never been more excited to create than this year with this machine, so I'll see you around.